morning. Thank you all so much for joining us here at New Hope Baptist Church of Prince George's County. We're glad to be here. Glad to have you. We want to lift the name of the Lord up this morning. We want to give him praise. Give him glory. He's worthy. He's everything. We just want to magnify him. Come on.
Good morning. Good morning, y'all. We're here to praise the Lord. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Giving honor and praise to God, I greet you on behalf of the New Hope Baptist Church of Prince George's County, located in Fort Washington, Maryland, where the pastor is the Reverend Carl Tillman Sr. I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exalt in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. This is my call to worship from Psalms 9, 1 through 2. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're coming to you this morning, Lord, to say thank you. Thank you for another day. Thank you for another opportunity, Lord, to do your will, your way. Lord, it's been good for some this week, Lord, but there have been some who've had loss. Lord, I ask that you bless the families of those that are waiting to hear what has happened to their loved ones in the condo that um, fell this week. 159 missing. 159 families wondering where their loved ones are. Wondering if they're going to get to see them again, Lord. Wondering if they're going to get to hug them again, Lord. Wondering if they're going to get to say the things that they have not said. To do the things they put off doing, Lord. But today we are here and we can get, take advantage of an opportunity to do those things. Don't allow time to pass and not do what it is you need to do. Don't allow time to fester on things that aren't worth it, Lord. Lord, I pray that everyone here today, Lord, remembers that you are the power. That you have the power, Lord. That you are always there. That you keep us in your hand. We just have to say yes. We just have to be willing, Lord. We just need to be obedient, Lord. And that's such a simple thing to do, Lord. And all we have to do is just say yes. And so, Lord, today we say yes to you and to your power, Lord. We say yes to all that you have given us. We say thank you for the things that we want, the things that we need, and the things we may never get, Lord. But we thank you because you yes. know what we need. Lord, and I ask that you be with everyone here today, Lord, that you be with the minister today, Lord, and that you be with those that are listening. Because you can send a message from high, but if we don't open our ears and hear it, Lord, it doesn't do any good. Mm -hmm. So I pray today that everyone that's listening to the sound of my voice, that they open their ears, that they open their hearts, yeah. that they can receive what our guest has to offer us from you, Lord. Yeah. That we know that power is only there if you're connected. Yes. And that we are connected. All we have to do is just say yes. 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 Amen. Amen. Today, Lord, we are blessed that we have someone with us that's not a guest. You know, it's a wonderful thing when family comes home. That's right. yes. And today, we have another family member here from us to visit with us. All the way down 295 from Baltimore. Amen. That's a, that's a, that's a task. Because sometimes Baltimore doesn't seem that far, but when you get on that beltway and you have to go on that parkway, far, far, you far. feel like you're going to North Carolina. <laughs> yes. But today, Lord, he has been obedient, and he has come to share a word from you, Lord. Lord, he is a man of God. He is a, he's, he's a devoted husband and father, a lover of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah. He's an ordained minister. Yeah. He's not just good enough to love the Lord, but he's gone that extra step. He's a minister. So he studied. Yeah. He has put the time in and the work in, Lord. And he is a member of the new Bethel House of Prayer where he faithfully serves as the armor bearer to his pastor. Amen. He's a member of the praise and worship team. Yeah. See, some of us think we can do one thing and it's enough. But this gentleman recognizes that God says serve. Mm. And to serve willingly everywhere you can. And he 
He's a member of the Praise and Worship Team and a leader of the Men's Fellowship. Yeah. We need men to stand up, and he's a stand-up guy. Oh, God. He's attended the University of Maryland at College Park and is currently a student that, um, at the University of Phoenix where he is working to complete his MBA. See, it's not enough to just be studying a little bit. We got to keep going. Right. And the more we can, the more we should. And he's doing that. So he currently works as a hospital administrator and during the last 20 years has taken his love for teaching the principles of God's word and used it to help transform the cultures of a, member, a number of organizations. Mr. Carr's favorite scripture is from Proverbs 3, 5 to 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. Yeah. He knows it's about God's way, not his way, Lord. Mr. Carr has a lovely wife, Raquel. He has two daughters, Mackenzie, five, and a nine-year-old, Jacob. And he currently resides in Potenton, Maryland. And he's here today to bless us with a word from the Lord. Amen. And I ask that you recognize what a blessing he is yeah. and that you greet him in such a manner. Amen. I introduce the summer and present to others, Mr. Johnny E. Carr. Amen. Amen. God bless you, family. I do, I do love calling you family. I, I'm always excited when I get the call to come to um, this portion of the venue, it is a wonderful portion of the venue. I often like to say it's a, uh, a small church, but a big praise. Amen. And I thank God for your faithfulness. And thank God for the invitation. Will you do me um, a favor um, before we get started? Now, you, you may remember that um, my wife gives me protocols. She says, stop fiddling with everything. And so, so I need a few minutes to get myself calmed down. So I'm, 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 I'm going to ask. The, uh, the musicians, just to play anything, it doesn't matter which way, just, just play something. Um, and um, I do not take it lightly um, that I am um, privileged to occupy this space. This, this is a sacred space. And ministering to uh, God's people uh, is an important task. But um, we serve an amazing God. I said, we serve an amazing God. If this pandemic has taught me anything, it's taught me that God is sovereign. And God is still God. And he holds the entire world in his hand. And if he decides to take back his breath just like that, he can take it. And so I believe he deserves a standing ovation. So I'm going to ask you to stand on your feet and clap your hands. And I want you to think about something that God has done for you this week. Because it's not about me. It's, it's about the God that we all serve. It's the, the same God who put the sun and the moon in the sky. And it's the same God who got us. Yeah, I know we just heard that 159 people. We're not sure where they are. But, but I thank God that we made it. So if you're excited that you made it to the household today, come on. Clap your hands. I heard somebody say, I was glad when they said unto me. Let us go into the house of the Lord. I don't know about you, but all week long, I look forward to getting to the house. Because there's some struggle out there uh, sometimes. But I, I appreciate it. Go on and, and take your seat. You may, you may take uh, your seat. But I never want to start without acknowledging the awesome, awesome God that we serve. Because uh, he is awesome. It is not my desire to be before you long on today. Um, this is my timer. <laughs> Um, I've been taught well. Um, I just want to give you what God gave to me. Um, I often say to you when I come here that whenever I'm asked to come here, um, God always waits until the last minute to give me what I'm supposed to say. And I'm always struggling out to be like, you want to give it to me? You want to give it to me? And initially I thought I was going to come on uh, Father's Day, so I was already starting to write that, and um, that shifted. Uh, but the Bible says, be you also ready. That's what that means, right? And so, um, he finally gave it to me, uh, and I do believe there's a word in the house for somebody. Are you ready for the word on today? Yeah. Did you come excited to hear the word on today? Yeah. Amen. Amen. First and foremost, I give honor to God the Father, uh, who is the head of my life and in whom I live and move and have my being. Uh, I give honor to the angel of this great ministry in his absence and the 
person of the record, Carl Tillman, and his lovely wife, Deacon Joan Tillman, a.k.a. Auntie and Uncle, <laughs> for me. Um, to my fellow ministers of this great gospel, to all the church officers, Sister Judy, God bless you. We love you so much. You are such a, a faithful servant, as all of you are. Um, to all the church officers, auxiliaries, and service in their respective places, uh, we honor you on today. To my lovely wife and family. Hi, Mom. I'm sure she's watching. Uh, to those, and I'm a mama's boy, y'all know that. Uh, to those in both Christ and creation, and that's important because if you know Jesus, you're in Christ. But if you don't know him, you're in creation. But I want to tell you, there's a chance for you to come and know him more today. But I want to make sure you understand that's important. I bring you greetings on behalf of my pastor, Bishop Michael Smith, and Minister Toya Daly Smith, and the entire New Bethel House of Prayer family. And of course, I bring you greetings in the mighty and master's name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to the book of Genesis. To the book of Genesis, chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Now, uh, <laughs> I'm going to get myself in some trouble here today because um, I, when, you, when you select a certain portion of scripture, they call it a block, or I think the formal term is called a pericope. It's a block. And what we're taught is to just kind of narrow down the scriptures. Uh, but the message that I have today, I, I kind of had to jump around to a bunch of places. So I'm, it's going to be a little awkward. I'm going to actually read from Genesis 2 and Genesis 3. I'll be reading from the New International Version. And I'll, I'll tell you where I'm going. You can follow along if you want, but you can trust uh, me to read it for you. But uh, we're going to be reading from the book of Genesis, the beginning, chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, 15 and 17. And then we're going to flip down to chapter 3. 1 and 6, and again, I'll be reading from the NIV version. Genesis 2, let's start with 8 and 9. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, and if it's your custom to stand, please do so. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east. What did he plant? Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. Where did he put the man? In the garden. Mm -hmm. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. I want to say that part again. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were both the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work and take care of it. Why did he put him in the garden? To work. And to take care of it. Uh -huh. his, his assignment was to take care of the garden and everybody in the garden. I want y'all to remember that now. And the Lord God commanded the man, commanded him, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. It didn't say he would die. He said you will certainly die. Chapter 3, verse 1 and 6. We'll start with verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. Who made the serpent? Wow. Okay. All right. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Verse 6. Here's your word. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and she ate it. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Let's open up with a word of prayer right before we get started. Father, I want to begin by thanking you for everything before I ask you for anything. I honor you today for the awesome, wonderful, and amazing God that you are. God, I thank you for the privilege of occupying this sacred space to minister your word to your people whom you love so dearly. Now, Father, hide me behind the power of the cross and the splendor of the empty tomb. For your glory, allow someone under the sound of my voice to be moved to seek your salvation is my prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Uh, I'd like to take um, the next few moments to speak to you um, as the Spirit gives utterance on the subject, 
don't fall for the okie doke. Uh, don't fall for the okie doke. At some point in our existence, we will all encounter temptation and be forced to make choices that will significantly impact the quality of our lives and the lives of those we are connected to. Uh, making choices is a fact of life and an integral part of God's original plan for men. You may remember God said, I give you this choice. The presence of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the Garden of Eden supports this fact. Now, I, 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 when, I, when I began to read the, the text for today, I said, why would God put a tree in the middle and then say, the middle, not on the end, not around the corner. Why would he put it in the middle and then say, you can't eat from it? Now, see, God never does anything without a purpose. And remember, everything that God does is eternal. Everything he does has an eternal purpose. And we'll come back, we won't talk about that. Let me start my timer. But contrary to what the enemy would have us believe, we do not ever have to face trouble or make significant choices alone or in isolation. Uh, that's the okie doke. The enemy wants to make you think that when you make a choice, you're on your own. We were created to be in eternal, intimate relationship with God. That's the truth. God is on our side and is always available to help us. That's the whole truth. We never have to walk alone unless we choose to. That's the hard truth. Here's another hard truth. God never left us. It was us who left God. Somebody say amen. amen. Come on, somebody. I know you want to hear that, but somebody say amen. amen. The truth is God loves us and desires that we live with him in paradise for eternity. Satan's desire is to deceive us, especially in the area of who God is and what God has said. He's always attacking God's word. In fact, he went to Jesus himself and tried to attack Jesus, I mean, attack God's word to Jesus himself. The truth is, God's plan for us leads to eternal life, watch this, through faith and obedience. Satan's plan for us leads to death and eternal separation through deception and rebellion. The truth is God commands us because he loves us. In other words, the commandments are about love. They're not about uh, making you feel uh, pressured. or They're, they're not about uh, hemming, hemming you up. Uh, God gives us the commandments because he loves us. Satan tempts us because he hates God and he hates us. I'm going to say that again. Satan hates God and he hates us. Let me, make it, let me get a little closer. He hates you and he hates me. God is our friend and Satan is our enemy. Am I talking good? Y'all hear what I'm saying today? Okay. And so as it relates to the quality of our lives and our destiny, our primary assignment in this life, should we choose to accept it, is to choose between accepting the truth of God or fall prey to the deception of the devil. That's, that's it. That, that's how you sum life up right there. Okay. But all along the way, you need to remember, you never walk alone. You never walk alone. Okay. It is literally the most important decision you will ever have to make in this life because it has eternal consequences. You know, uh, the problem with, with the world today is that folk don't have a sense of consequence. Folks think that because you can't see it, because you can't hear it, you can get away with it. But I want you to understand something. Uh, God had an original plan uh, for perfection. That plan still stands. Doesn't matter what man do. That does not thwart the plan of God. God is going to reconcile his people back unto him. And it is going to happen. There's going to be heck to pay for those who don't honor to that. Now, Genesis is a collection of firsts. It talks about the beginning of God's restoration plan for his intimate relationship with man. God wants to get us back in the garden. The rest of the Bible is the story of God working to rebuild his relationship with humanity, to get rid of sin, and to restore his perfect creation. As beings in Christ or creation, God gives us the power and responsibility to advance or reject the plan of God 
in our lives. I said, you have the power to advance or reject the plan of God in your life through the choices we make. Now, in our selected text on today, I see this responsibility as God providing, the enemy dividing, and man deciding. I said, I see the responsibility in our text as God providing, the enemy dividing, because the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy, <laughs> and man deciding. And said another way in our text, I see provision, division, and decision. <laughs> if I handle my assignment properly today, we're going to examine all three verbs and provide you with three points and a few illustrations that will make the case for those who have not done so to choose the truth of God over the deception of the devil. The devil is a liar. He is the father of lies. There is no truth in him. You cannot believe a word that comes out of his mouth. And if it didn't come from God, because every good and perfect thing comes from, okay, y'all help me, y'all help me, it's all right. Come on, so let's go to work. So, so, so let's define this. The Urban Dictionary defines the term okie doke in this way. A moment of extreme unpleasantness. Being swindled, hoodwinked, backstabbed, or otherwise screwed over. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines communion in this way. The sharing or exchanging of intimate thoughts and feelings, especially when the exchange is on a mental or spiritual level, intimate fellowship or rapport, that's what we want with God. We want intimate fellowship. We want to share intimate feelings. And, 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 and I want you to understand that when you talk to God, it doesn't have to be this formal kind of, uh, you know, you got to have the atmosphere set. You can turn to your left and say, God, I love you. I heard uh, at, at the hospital where I work, uh, one, of the, one of the priests who works up on the COVID unit, she said, I have a cup of coffee with Jesus every morning. She said, I sit down and I have a conversation with him. But see, the enemy wants to make you believe that you can't talk to God. He wants to make you think that, let me calm down, I'm starting, I'm starting to get excited. He wants you to make, you, that's the okie doke, he wants to make you think that God is unreachable. He wants to make you think that you have to have permission to talk to God. I got news for you. If you don't write anything else down, write this down. God created you to talk to him. God created you to have relationship with him. Jesus died so that you could have direct access through the Father through him. The devil is a liar. I'm going somewhere with this thing now. We're going to get back to Adam and Eve because they started all this nonsense. <laughs> They had one job. One job. What was the job? Don't eat from the tree. What? That was their tree. What's our tree? We can't, we can't kill, we can't spill, we can't, you know, we can't cover down. They had one job. So after reading our text, the question then becomes: why is the enemy attempting? to run the okie doke. What is he trying to swindle us out of? Why is he working so hard? What's so good that he's trying to get away from us? What's his angle? Jeremiah 29 and 11 helps answer this question because it reminds us that God has a plan for our life. For I know the plans I have for you. You ever, um, when you were growing up and your mama or your daddy said, yeah, we got some plans next week, we going on vacation. Didn't that excite you? But like, all right, we're going to go get, all right. Well, God has plans for you. And if God has plans for you, we serve a big God and he's a God of splendor. There must be some pretty magnificent plans. If he's been gone away this time, they're going to prepare a place for you. I know a lot of people say he wants to prepare a mansion. That ain't what the word said. The word ain't say you get a mansion. He said place. He said place. But my pastor likes to say, I don't care if it's an efficiency. <laughs> if God is there, I'm going to be there. Amen? Amen. Okay. And it also says that God wants to give you a hope and a future. So as I begin, as I began to study and, and I unpack our text, God showed me that Satan works to attack our gratitude to God and throw shade on God's divine plan. He 
works to attack our gratitude. That's what he did with Eve. He, he put all this stuff in the garden. I mean, he said there were trees, and, and he said they were, he said they all were good. He said they all were good. But he begins to attack our gratitude. That's what God showed me. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. That's what, what Timothy said. We should acknowledge and be grateful for all the wonderful blessings God has already provided. And that brings me to my first point. Maintain an attitude of gratitude for God's blessings. I said maintain an attitude of gratitude for God's blessings. When, when, when God says no, you better believe there's a good reason. He's trying to protect us. He's being a father. That's the job of a father to protect his children. But we need to stop looking outside of God for our peace. We need to stop looking outside of God for our pleasure. We need to stop looking outside of God for our prosperity. Because whatever doesn't begin with God will ultimately end in failure and defeat. Don't neglect what God has provided to you. If God gave it to you, there's something good in it. God spent six entire days creating the perfect habitat for man in Genesis. Six days. I mean, it was perfect. Anybody ever been to the islands? Yeah, it's beautiful, isn't it? Multiply that by like 10 Kakroyan times, if you can. When I say it was perfect, that's what God created, and that's what he's going to do for us again, but that's what he created. The Garden of Eden represents God's perfect creation. Family, there was no sin, no death, no, no pain, no spiritual knowledge of evil or temptation, no tension, no darkness, no sickness, no COVID. I mean, it was perfect. It was perfect peace. It was perfect provision, and it was perfect relationship. Adam and Eve could talk to God. The Bible says he walked in the garden in the cool of the day. It said he walked in the garden, and they could just talk to him. But remember, the devil likes to make us focus on a little that's wrong. So we miss the big picture of all that's right. And most of us spend years chasing things in this world that we think will make us feel loved. But everything the world has to offer is temporary. The kind of love our souls are craving, God created that gap. He created the gap that only he can feel. The kind of love filled, the kind of love that we're craving is a lasting, eternal love and only God can fill that gap. So if you're searching and you're not being filled, you got to fill it with God. Are you listening? With every action, comment, conversation, you have a choice to invite heaven or hell into your life. Satan has no power over us except what we Moment by moment, decision by decision, step by step, we will operate in God's all-powerful truth or allow Satan to entangle us. <laughs> and I'll give an example how, as humans, we never seem to be satisfied. I'm, I'm going to look at the floor when I say this, because I don't know why I think I'm talking about them. I know a lot of stuff. Now, not, now, I know that's not true here, but a lot of people struggle with tithing. God said, you can keep 90, and I'll keep 10. That's what he said to Adam and Eve. He said, you can have all these trees, you can leave all these trees, but this one right here, can't eat from them. Why do we always want? Think about it this way. Nine out of 10 choices were available to them, and they still chose one. Why is that? Why is that? So here's your call to action for point one. Make it a daily habit to tell the Lord thank you for all he has provided for you. Just, just, just get up in the morning and part of your prayer should be, and you may have heard when I started my prayer, I said, Lord, I want to thank you for everything before I ask you for anything. And that came from a, a young preacher in my church. He starts all his prayers off like that. Nothing has blessed me ever since I heard it. Lord, I'm just going to start the day off by saying thank you. Because you know what? The enemy attacks your gratitude. And whatever you focus on develops. So if you focus on what you don't have, 
If you focus on uh, how how people, how angry people make you, and if you focus on uh, then, you, then, then your gratitude, they'll start to chip away. So your call to action is make it a daily habit to tell the Lord thank you for all he's done. Now it's no secret that Satan's greatest aim is to deceive us, especially in the area of who God is and what he said. And that serves as a great leading to my second point. Don't be fooled by the familiar. Now, just because it's familiar doesn't mean it's appropriate. And just because you know it doesn't mean you should go with it. Let me say it that way. How about that? Um, and when you look at chapter 3, uh, verse 1, look at chapter 3, verse 1. And this is what it says. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Now the Bible says my sheep know my voice and the stranger they will not follow. But here we have the serpent speaking up to Eve. Now you may remember I said Adam's assignment was to protect what God gave him, that was Eve. That's why he was placed in the garden. Eve's responsibility was to be a helper to Adam. See, God set it all up. I'm setting it all up so y'all can be successful. Your job is to cover Adam. Your job is to help Eve. But see, the only person who lived up to their responsibility in the text was the serpent. See, because serpent means one who is opposed to God. That's what serpent means, right? So, so I want to go back to. I want you to. I want, want you to listen to this chapter three. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, "Did God really say you must not eat from the tree of God? Why was he so comfortable going up to even talking to her? Did, did they have? Now, remember, they, I want to set the stage for. It. They were in the garden. Were they friends? Did, did, he, did he feel so, why did he feel so comfortable talking to her? And if his name was Serpent, which means one opposed to God, who named all the animals in the garden? Her husband. Adam named every animal in the garden. You mean to tell me her and her husband didn't have a conversation? I know they did, you know, me and my wife have conversations all the time. Yeah, yeah baby, see that one right there? Mm -mm. That's Serpent. Anybody here ever named their child Serpent? You know why they're naming child serpent? Who gonna name a child one opposed to God? See, there's power in the name. I want you to understand something. Eve's responsibility was to be a helper. The way you help us to be obedient. The way you help us to do what God told you to do. One of the best ways to be unable to enjoy the present is to always be in want of something in the future. The more we look ahead at earthly blessings, the less we can experience the good that God has granted us right now. <laughs> we so focus on what we don't have, we're overlooking what God has already given us. Yeah. That wonderful husband, that wonderful wife, that amazing church, that great job, those beautiful children. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. God is clear. I want you to desire me. I want you to spend time communing with me. I want you to listen to what I'm sharing with you because the words that I'm giving you are life and they bring life. Eve should have known the dangers of engaging in conversation with uh, the serpent, and Adam should have warned her. They should have been prayer partners. They should have been talking about it on a regular basis. There is no substitute for spending quality time with God to help increase your faith, enhance your confidence, and develop discernment. That's where you get your power from. You get your power from spending time with God. That's where you build your faith. You build your faith by spending time with God. Yes, by, by coming to the house of uh, prayer, but also by spending time in prayer and by spending time uh, in communion with God. It means turning off your television. Is anybody listening to me? It means uh, opening up your Bible. Uh, it means spending quality time with God, listening to Him. Don't let the devil deter you from discovering 
your destiny. Your destiny is paradise. That's your destiny if you're a child of God. Your destiny is providence. That's your destiny if you're a child of God. The devil's desire is to isolate you, to pull you away from God, to cause you to doubt the words of people who truly love you. That's what the Bible means when it says the battle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against spiritual wickedness, principalities, and high places. The devil understands if I can get you mad at her, if I can get you mad at him, if I can get you confused with him, if I, if I can stir up confusion there, and here's the thing, he can only stir up what we allow him to stir up. That's why you got to stay prayed up while he's stirring up. That's why you got to stay in God's face. That's why Eve, she got, Adam got the command directly from God. God spoke directly to Adam. So he heard his voice. The devil wants to block revelation from God that two are better than one. I can do this on my own. I don't need nobody. He wants to uh, confuse you, make you think that wisdom in the counsel of many is not right. Yes, it is. He wants you to seek that divorce or, or quit school or, or leave that church. So here's your call to action. Prioritize setting aside daily time to hear from and talk to God through reading the word and prayer. Prioritize setting aside daily time to hear from and talk to God through reading the word and prayer. Get by yourself. Prayer is how we talk to God. Reading his word is how he talks to us. Take a pen and some paper with you uh, when you go into your private time with God and, and write down what he reveals to you and then meditate on it and obey what he tells you to do. I believe with all my heart that if Adam and Eve had done that, we might be in a different situation. So if you heard something today, I pray you write it down and go home and ask God about it. Talk to God about it. Well, on my way up here, I was talking to God. God, I sure hope you give me something to say. God, I sure hope if I, you know, I stutter sometimes. God, I talk too fast. And I pray to you with his help. You know, you, you got to talk to him. You got you to have a relationship. The same way you have a relationship, or maybe not the same way, because some of us relationships have been good. But he wants you to have a solid relationship with him. He loves you. He's standing, he is literally standing there waiting. I, I was uh, read a hymn the other day and said, Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his mercy and grace. I mean, that's good. When you focus on Jesus, everything else gets dim. It's that simple. It's that simple. But always remember that Satan seeks to devour us. He can never be trusted. So as 1 Peter, uh, 1 Peter 5 and 8 reminds us, we must be sober. We must be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. It's especially important to remember this when faced with making important decisions. Watch this. Point three, when faced with a choice, recall God's voice. When faced with a choice, recall God's voice. Here's another way saying, don't make a decision, don't make a move, don't do a thing until you talk to God. That's part of the problem. A lot of us is, is we, we, we do things and, and, and we, we don't realize that we can ask God what you think about it. Is God standing right there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The freedom of choice is bound by the weight of consequence. Did you, did you hear what I just said? The freedom of God gives us freedom, but there are consequences to your choices. Yeah. God gives us the freedom to choose with the understanding that the choice and the consequence are joined at the hip. <coughs> Wisdom is the difference between making a good and poor decision. And the fear of the Lord or reverence for God is the beginning of wisdom. So if you reverence God, you will have wisdom. So if God doesn't endorse it, train your appetite to divorce it. When God says no, let it go. Your decisions determine your destiny. The quality of our lives is determined by the choices we make. So make wisdom the foundation of your choices. Eve could have consulted God, but she chose not to. 
Uh, she could have called on the master uh, to nullify a disaster. But she didn't. One version says that he stared at the tree. She didn't just look at it. You know, my, like my wife, um, she, she, she window shops a lot. Like, like she won't buy. But she'll like window shot and she'll put stuff in the queue. Like she won't get by. But she should and so that means if she's doing that, that means she's been thinking about it, right? And she's just waiting for the right opportunity to go boop. But what I'm trying to tell you is when you focus on things, it becomes a part of you. Whatever you focus on develops. And because she was staring and staring, and, and I'm not saying my wife buying stuff is like Eve. I, I, I ain't trying to I ain't trying to say that. I'm just trying to say. You have to be mindful of your focus. I'm going to talk to the brothers right now. Here's one of the greatest ways you can protect your wife and protect your marriage. Fix your focus. Don't put yourself in compromising situations. If you know you like M&Ms, don't go to the candy store. <laughs> All right, y'all, y'all, that, that, that's how you protect your family. Okay, y'all got to clap. I know I'm preaching better than y'all saying amen. <laughs> Satan could tempt Eve, but she didn't have to take it. The taking was all her doing. Satan couldn't cram the fruit down her throat. Eve was responsible. She couldn't rightly say, the devil made me do it. As with every temptation, God made for Eve a way of escape. She could have simply run from Satan and the tree. The Bible says, resist him and he will flee. But Eve didn't take God's way of escape. Eve surrendered to this temptation in exactly the way John describes in verse John, 1 John 2.16. First she gave it to the lust of the flesh. She saw that it was good for food. Then she gave it to the lust of the eyes. It was pleasant to the eyes. Then she gave it to the pride of life, desirable to make one. Wise. Now, 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 brothers, Adam didn't. He ain't off the hook. As the head, when Adam ate the fruit, he not only doomed himself, he doomed his family. Consequences are not just personal. They are interpersonal and have a ripple effect. Sir, when you make a mistake, you, you damage your entire family. Sir, when you choose to step away or when you choose to step out or when you choose not to cover, as Adam did, that's what happens. Now, the Bible says he was actually watching, which, which is a whole different conversation in my mind. But a man's job is to cover. A man's job is to support. The enemy uses desire to tempt you, but God promises to give you the desires of your heart if you delight yourself in him. So, so in conclusion, guys, I want to just drop a few things on you, and hopefully you, um, some of these you've already uh, written down, but if not, then I'm happy to share them. Putting God first will provide you with the wisdom you need to make the right choices and select the right paths. Stop looking outside of God for your peace, your pleasure, and your prosperity. Whatever doesn't begin with God will ultimately end in failure and disappointment. Make loving, obeying God proud in your life, and he will direct your path. You don't have to face your challenges and your problems on your own. Remember, God is watching and available for consultation and guidance. So I'll give you three quick things that will kind of help you. Navigate, seek the wisdom of God. Demonstrate, walk in obedience to God and activate, tap into the power of God. Navigate, seek the wisdom of God, demonstrate, walk in obedience to God, and activate, tap into the power of God. And as I close, I just want to leave you with this verse of scripture from, um, from Deuteronomy. If you fully obey the Lord, your God, and carefully follow all his commandments I give you today, the Lord your God will set you high above the nations of the earth. All these blessings will come down on you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. You will be blessed in the city. 
and blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb will be blessed, and the crops of your, hand, your land and the young of your livestock, the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flock. Your basket and your kneading trough will be blessed. You will be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. The Lord will grant that the enemies who rise up against you will be defeated before you. They will come at you from one direction, but flee from you in seven. This is all for obedience. The Lord will send a blessing on your barns and on everything you put your hand to. The Lord, your God, will bless you in the land he is giving you. The Lord will establish you as his holy people, as he promised you on oath. If you keep the commands of the Lord your God and walk in obedience to him, then all the peoples of the earth will see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they will fear you. The Lord will grant you abundant prosperity in the fruit of your womb, the young of your livestock and the crops of your ground, and the land he swore to your ancestors to give you. The Lord will open the heavens the storehouse of his bounty, to send rain on your land in season, and to bless all the works of your hands. So you got to be working to get blessed. It's going to bless all the works of your hand. You will lend to many nations, but will borrow from none. The Lord will make you the head and not the tail. If you pay attention to the commands of the Lord your God that I give you this day, and carefully follow them, you will always be at the top and never at the bottom. Do not turn aside from any of these commands I give you today to the right or the left, following other gods and serving them. Television is a god. Music can be a god. Uh, 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 going to the club uh, can be a God, but I thank God that we serve a God that is always available and willing to have conversations with us. What God is trying to tell you is that when you follow God, you are blessed. That means you carry the Almighty God, the Spirit of the Almighty God, inside of you, that wherever you go, wherever you go, you take the Spirit of the Lord with you. That means when you go to work, that place is blessed. That means you bring heaven with you to that place. That means all the prayers for that place are going up. That means you change and shift the atmosphere when you go into a place. But you have to be obedient. You have to study your word. You have to meditate on your word day and night. You have to resist the devil so that he will flee. You have to know God's word. You have to talk to God. You've got to commune with God. You've got to advocate for God. You've got to call on Jesus. You've got to say his name. You can't be ashamed of his gospel. You've got to tell people about him. You've got to walk and talk. And when people try to talk to you, you've got to open your mouth. What the devil wants is to silence you. The devil wants you to sit down, but God wants you to stand up and clap your hands on all you people. He said, oh, Everything that has breath, let everything that has breath uh, praise the Lord. I don't know about you, but I'm not ashamed to bless the Lord, my God, because He's been that good. He's been good to New Hope, and I'm telling you, He's been good to your pastor, He's been good to your members, He's been good to your children, He's been good to your family, He's got you a job. I heard somebody complaining that they lost their job and they got another one for eight dollars an hour, and then they started complaining because they kids were opening up the refrigerator and food was coming out and he started raising his voice and the Holy Spirit convicted him. Food, you got food falling out of the refrigerator and he's making eight dollars an hour. We keep taking God. I'm taking God at his word. God is good. Even when you don't think he's good, God is good. God is so good. Even when he's not doing anything, he's doing everything. Yeah. That's the God we serve. Don't fall for the okie doke. Stay in communion with God. Stay in prayer with God. And your life will be blessed. Y'all pray my strength in the Lord. I love you and you guys. If, uh, if you've been listening to this message and you don't know God for whatever reason, and you want to know him, God makes it very, very easy for you to come to know him. I like to call them the ABCs of salvation. The A is if you accept the Lord as your Savior, you accept the fact that he died on the cross for you, and you believe that he sacrificed his life for you, you confess with your lips that that, that, that is the case, 
The Bible says you shall be saved right then, right there. If you want to do that, you can put something in the chat if you aren't. I'm sure that someone from the church will be happy to contact you. But if you don't know him and you want to talk to somebody, just let us know. Just let us know. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Do you want to do the closing selection now? Yes? Yes. Okay. I need you. Yes. I need you. Thank you.